Welcome to Oleg Show. You're watching Alien TV. On today's episode, like if you want to move 50 million dollars from like Russia to the United States, what better way to do that than a canvas and a tube? On today's show, I'm privileged to have a really special guest, award-winning director, DP, and documentary filmmaker based in Hollywood, LA. Colin Michael Day. Born to a family of a news cameraman, he grew up around local news media rooms in Sacramento and got introduced to journalism from a very young age. He has shot nearly 100 short films, profiling some of the art world's most infamous personalities, including legends of the American street art scene. Ralph Steadman, Retna, Dose Green, O.S. Gemos, Ben Ein, Anthony Lister, Risk, Revoke, Roa, Heracut and Neil Schumann. He has also shared film projects featuring Snoop Dogg, Sanjay Kupta, and Kerry Irving. He has collaborated and created content for broadcasting networks like CBS, CNN, and IGN. His films tell stories of rebellion, freedom, social and political, mainstream and underground culture, opening a window to the counterculture world that only an insider might get an access to. His first documentary feature film, Saving Banksy, shot in 2017, featured on Netflix, has received a Critics' Pick Award by New York Times and positive reviews by Los Angeles Times, Village Voice, Hollywood Reporter and San Francisco Chronicle. In 2020, he has released his second feature social political documentary film, The Art of Protest, in collaboration with the Indecline Street Art Activist Group. Featured by Rolling Stone magazine, it raises on easy topics of political correctness social activism, resistance art, and human rights. With that being said, Colin, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here, man. Excellent. Uh, you know, uh, I was really uh, excited to uh, do this interview with you. I discovered your film, your first feature, Saving Banks, a couple of weeks ago, and I was completely blown away by your style and by the narration and by the, you know, the whole production altogether. It was very easy to watch, and uh, I'm really excited to talk, to talk to you about filmmaking and that part of your journey, artistic journey. You know, shooting over 100 films, it's quite uh, a lot, or nearly 100 films. Correct me if I'm wrong, but a large chunk of your work is dedicated to art. Why art specifically? How did you come to covering art in your works? Kind of came about out of survival. You know, I graduated from college right in like 2008, which here in the U.S., that's when the banks collapsed. Right. So like all of a sudden there was like no work and I had all this student loan debt and shit. Right. So it was just like, I, I was like, you know, working for the school that I like went to yeah. and like was indebted by not being paid enough to pay my fucking loans. Wow. And, you know, and the only thing that I knew, and I lived in San Francisco though, which is a place where tourists all over the world like travel to. Right. 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 So like I'm in a magical like environment and, uh, I, I knew a lot of artists just because I've always been an artistic person. So like even through school and when I was working, trying to do professional commercial work and like, you know, I always still knew artists. Right. You know, like graffiti and stuff like that. So were you like hanging um, out with artists? Uh, yeah. Yes. And then I just was like, hey, I'm a trained cameraman. Why don't I just film this shit? And so like, then it just started naturally. And then, but it was like almost like a manic, just like once it started going, I saw an opportunity and just started rolling, you know, and I was doing like at the peak, like four to six videos a month. Wow. Like, that's, a, that's know, intense. So it was like, it was just kind of like nonstop. There was no off, right, off right. point, but right. of course that, that burned me out a couple of times. Like, you know, I've also deal with like health issues. Oh, right. So like I've had like two blood transfusions during the, oh, wow. Season, oh, wow. Oh, wow. Like, uh, like five or six hospitalizations insane a turbulent period but right you know things like that also i find if you follow the right like wavelength with it like if you don't fight against the project if you just kind of follow where the story is like naturally going it's going to end up somewhere you know that it needs yeah. to end up in the end and then you just right. focus on capturing it, right you know right. and that's kind of what i did because the amount of turbulence there was no planning you could plan all you wanted Right. But then as soon as you walk in our basil, you know, and like, <laughs> you've got all this, got this guy lying about right. like all this shit, like, right. you know, like need to say, I haven't been invited to any art fairs since Satan makes it came out. Right. Like, I don't right. get invited to art fairs anymore. 
how do you think, uh, what were the cornerstone moments, the pinnacle moments uh, in your creative path that helped you to shape yourself as a director uh, nowadays? I'd say one of the biggest ones was working with Retina. So like I was, I was doing a lot of stuff for artists where, you know, I wasn't charging a lot. I was doing it more for the opportunity to like travel and like, you know, meet people. And, but I was getting paid enough to like basically cover my expenses. Right. Right. Way below my commercial rates, you know, after working with Retina, which was a really like, it was in Miami during Art Basel, like 2000, between 10 and 11, I think. But he was writing brimstone on a giant wall and it was like a really intense shoot. And it right. like, um, kind of like, made me have to like prove like who I was as a filmmaker because like it was such like kind of like an intense situation right but then afterwards he found out how little I was being paid for the work that I was doing right and like basically put pressure on the other end to be like yo if you want to put your name on this video right that he fucking made right you have to pay him what he's worth from now on wow and it was like say five times what I was currently getting paid wow wow and their response was just like yep you know, like done, because right. uh, they needed it at that point, you know? Right. And right. after that, he hooked it up with those Gemios, and it was just like, it was just like a rocket launch, you know, like, like working with him really kind of like. Helped, like helped you to, 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 took off basically. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So like, and I, and it's like, Mo is something I have a ton of respect for, you know, just as an artist, mm -hmm. everything mm -hmm. he's accomplished. Like, dude has fucking private jet. Like, he's paying tailwings of private jet lines, you know? Like, right, right, right. He did, like, the San Francisco Opera House. And wow. Shit. Wow. You know? wow. So it's like, but he's also, like, you know, one of, like, LA's, like, graffiti kings. Right, right. So, how, how many projects you've made before you've jumped on doing film with him? Probably, like, 15. 15. So and I did you... a couple big ones. Like, I did one with uh, Belgian artist Roa. Um, right before him, uh, Retina. Right. right. And uh, Roa is like a real, real fascinating. Like that guy deserves like a mm -hmm. documentary just on him, like straight up. Like he's right. one of the most incredible. I'll send you some of his artwork. Right. But he paints giant black and white animals, like uh, right. natural to their habitat, but like raccoons. Sometimes they're skinned. Sometimes they're alive and happy. You know. But he's a totally anonymous. Hides his. I, I believe he still hides his identity. Okay. Um, back when I worked with him, he didn't want his voice even recorded. Wow. So like I had to tell his story without any of that, but because he painted animals, right. The solution was to interview him with like a transcript, like just have him write it with right. his broken English kind of. Right. And right. And have like a David Attenborough actor impersonator okay. read his interview like a nature documentary. Right. Right. And film him painting his animals, but then have it narrated like with David Attenborough. <laughs> you know, so, we're talking about graffiti right, and stuff. Right. So you found your way how to present this material. Yeah. Uh, did you work at the time with the production company or were you completely independent filmmaker at that point? Yeah, nobody would ensure that kind of stuff. I was completely right. independent. Right, right. Insane. Nobody could touch any of it legally because it was like... Insane. If something goes wrong... You know, then if your company is attached to it, then it becomes like a whole fucking, it becomes an ordeal. You it's, know? A, it's an institutional thing, right? It's like yeah. bureaucracy and yeah. all that kind of stuff. Do you see any parallels with yourself and maybe Terry Guetta, Mr. Brainwash, in terms of like how you were getting into the space, following this artist, documenting basically the art? I think there's one big difference, and this might be controversial, but like, I think I'm a little bit less exploitive. Right. I feel like Terry right. was a little bit exploitive with how he went about right. shit. Right, right. And I think I'm not trying to become a famous artist myself. Right, right. You know, right. like I'm an artist, but I'm not like, you know, for me, right. it's like, it's about just creation. Exactly. So like, I'm not trying to, that's different, you know. Right, right, right. Like the movies well, are telling stories and mm -hmm. trying to like bridge, you know, narratives together and like um, enlighten people to some of the more subtle nuances and within the art world. Right. And the right. art world actually pervades through everything in life. But mm -hmm. I think art just makes things more palatable, especially things that are naturally like not palatable, like right. politics right. of just like things going on in the world and toxic kind of right. Uh, behavior. Right. Um, so like when you have uh, nice visuals, that always makes those other things more palatable. So I always like right. working with artists that were talking about these intense subject matter. 
Right. Because then it just makes this intense subject matter easier for the consumer. Right. To like, you know, internalize basically. In. And then they're less, they're less defensive when they're watching it too. Because right. if they're watching it, it's like Nightline or like 2020 or those like, you know, more traditional, hard hitting kind of like, right. like what my dad shot, you know, right. or shoot. Like people go into it knowing what they're watching. And so right. they'll put on blinders. And now, especially being suspicious of the media, right. that kind of stuff is almost comically ineffective. Right. Because people just know they're being manipulated. Right. You know, right. By MSNBC or Fox or CNN or whoever it is. Right. They know right. that the message is being filtered. Right. You know, right. and they're right. suspect. Right. Whether or not it's malicious or whether or not they're just trying to make a profit is like reality. Right. Have you come across any instances of, uh, let's say, art being used uh, as a propaganda um, uh, to, you know, convey certain messages or to, you know, project certain ideas through art? Uh, yeah. Actually, this last election, I forget what the uh, crew is called, but there's basically like a like, you know, in decline, kind of mm -hmm. like, in declines politics is very kind of like, I'd say, probably far left, right. you know, on the spectrum right. of the left, right spectrum. There's another group here, though, in LA, that started doing pro Trump, like in decline style, like installations. Interesting. And they had a, on their Instagram, they had a fucking PayPal account, where people could just donate which was an alarm bell for me because if you're doing right. illegal street pieces on billboards and stuff, right? How are you not? How are the police not like, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. tracking you with the PayPal that people are donating right. thousands right. of dollars to see you put all this like, you know, stuff up right. on clear channels billboards, not like public billboards. Like they're going after like billboards. I was initially suspect about that, so I question what their motives are. It's weird to see a graffiti movement like right. propping up the power structure you know what i'm saying like right, that was right, right. really kind of like twilight zone ish for me right i'm right. like that's right. not anything that i've ever kind of like i've been around this shit my whole life and i've studied it my whole life and it's like right. that's not at the core of any of it right. so i felt like appropriation now to give them credit they were doing like militaristic kind of like so i would assume they're probably like former military guys mm -hmm. they definitely had the taste for mischief the humor was a little bit too dark Okay. And like angry to be effective, in my opinion. Because Interesting. It's like, if you're going to just turn people off by doing like disturbing gut right. wrenching, people right. are going to associate you with that and then be turned off. If you go with a uh, like more Shepard Fairy like aesthetic and right. it's more subtle and it's more like nuanced, people are going people are going to be on your side. Right. Whereas right. like the city might still try and find you for you know people in the neighborhood are on your side. Exactly. And you won the battle at that point. And it's you also know, like how you present this information or how you present those visuals, right? It can be either very um, kind of uh, soft or it can be very radical. And I, I guess depending on what kind of emotion you are trying to evoke in the audience, then you are choosing your tools. Your uh, latest feature film, uh, Art of Protest, goes deeper into this resistance art movement and tries to kind of understand uh, the logic behind that world and uh, how it functions. Could you share a little bit how you came across uh, In Decline and how you jumped on this project and what was your initial idea with this film? In Decline, I actually, I went to college with like, a, a few siblings, a couple of sisters that were like, you know, connected, like back in like mid 2000s, like right mm -hmm. after, like right at the kind of beginning of the, of things. Right. So it's kind of like always in their peripheral, but like it wasn't until like right before they did the naked Trump statues in 2016, I just released Saving Banksy. And so like, there was kind of like an intersection that occurred. They kind of like let me in on what was about to like come out with that like naked Trump thing like a few months in advance and asked if I wanted to like document. Right. And so like I started working with them on that. And then those things just went like, you know, bananas when that happened, like, you know, it was just like a circus. And then like, you know, we stayed in touch. I'd help them out every time like, you know, I could, you know, I just like what they're about and they get they they go harder than like almost anybody around the world right and for good purpose too you know right. so it's right. like that's a win 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 in my book how do you think uh what is the main purpose of resistance art and how do you understand the purpose of resistance art yourself well resistance art is basically like a reaction to 
something that is just an oppressive force, you know, that, that could be financial, that could be like, you know, militaristic, it could be just like freedom of speech, it could be any kind of like oppression. But it's like, I feel like that resistance, resistance art in particular, is basically a response from individuals, mm -hmm. you know, they're just kind of like, need to get something out, you know, because of the pressure. And I think that's like part of the reason why you see such amazing artwork come from places like Oakland, California, mm -hmm. like Detroit, Michigan, and right. like New Orleans, Louisiana, you know, like all three of those places are just places where just like culture is just like created, like right. in, in tough situations, right. tougher situations than most cities in America have ever had to face. Right. You know, right. and it's like, and they not only do they like sustain and survive, but they do it with like, they flourish, you know, they, they right. still find ways to like enjoy life and shit. That, that was always kind of the hook that kind of drew me in is to like explore like what it is about like, you know, uh, the struggle mm. and the like, in the personal therapy of doing something about it and creating right. something. Right. So not only is it good for your soul to actually in the process of making this thing that mm -hmm. you believe in for a good purpose, mm -hmm. you know, it's just, a, it's just a good byproduct that comes with it, you know? Right. And how, how do usually artists in that particular field, how do they make their living? Do they have like their day jobs and then on the free time they do what they feel is right and they follow uh, that pattern or uh, other like organizations that support this artist? Like how does it work usually in, in, in the States? Most of them the, that I know are like successful artists already, like just mm -hmm. on their own. But when like worthy cause comes up, mm -hmm. they're happy to pivot and like put their like, you know, reputations and their like, you know, creative uh, skills mm -hmm. and the value that comes with that they're willing to put all of that like on the line for something they believe in. Right. And right. so, and, and so then it just becomes like a multiplier, right. You know, and, like how valuable it is for the organization mm -hmm. because they're kind of like a celebrity in a sense, who's like, you know, uh, endorsing. So I'd say that's probably the most straightforward way. Right. You know? Right. What was the reaction in the art community after the release of uh, the art of resistance? Most, I'd say it was mostly positive, mostly positive. It was aimed at activists, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. not going to like, you know, say, deny that it wasn't, you know, we've kind of right. like released it the way we released it to be like yes. a lightning rod to right. um, activists, like right before the election, right? just in right. case things like didn't turn out the way that right. we were like when they right. would, kind of a calculated, uh, mm -hmm calculated move in that regard that's right because the the language of the movie is very dynamic very it's 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 completely different from the style that you applied in in saving banksy uh like from observer and the kind of like um somebody who follows uh, the process you turned into an activist yourself in a way and kind of presenting all these different groups and like kind of showing to your face that see guys we have this going on and you should get on board <laughs> or otherwise it's it's on you so it's it's very interesting yeah. so do you think the film achieved its goals uh at the end how, how do you feel yourself personally i feel pretty good i mean mm -hmm. like i think you know it it achieved its goals in like just providing some inspiration and some like you know entertainment value i guess and all of that storm at that point it was a that was a messy period you know right, when we right. released it like mid-october it was like you know heading heading into the election and all it was pretty like there's a lot of toxic shit going on right you know right. um like i got like i actually did get like you know some dms from strangers like threatening to like try and ruin my career really wow uh, like uh yeah like uh threat of violence kind wow. of threats of violence wow uh most of that was pretty funny stuff yeah. so it wasn't like actually ever like you know implemented like scary in that regard yeah yeah but like so there was like there was a spectrum there were dark moments in the movie mm -hmm. you know there mm -hmm. were very dark moments and very intense moments and yeah. moments that are like hard for me to watch yeah. you know at this yeah. point right But it's like, it was an intense time too, right. you know? And I right. felt like we had to like, you know, we couldn't, we couldn't sugarcoat like why people were so like angry, you know, right. like right. why right. people were so fucked. 
fucking just over it. Because if you didn't, then it almost all, it would almost looked like a pandemic thing, you know? It mm. almost looked like it was just tied around the pandemic and all of that right. kind of shit. Right, right, right. But so, it's like, you know, it was, it was a tough decision, you know? Mm -hmm. tough decision. So basically the film is the representation, is the reflection of the world we live in, right? And of the moment in, in particular. Yeah. Talking about uh, your first feature, Saving Banksy, quite a big production. I was just like, checking it uh second time before before the interviews there are almost like 60 names on the list you know of the crew and uh can you share how did you got into that project and uh how it all started what was the you know the, the beginnings of that film so i was doing a lot of like you know just independent work at that point one of the producers of that film kind of like hit me up through the gallery scene and like kind of let me know what the story was with the like rat and what the guy was doing Mm -hmm. And like, it was right after Exit to the Gift Shop came out. And so like, there was like a period of time where I was just kind of getting to know him, see what he's about, you know, like, I, I was like, I didn't want to um, jump in if it was just like an opportunistic thing, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but he was, he was just ended up being cool, you know, really seemed like he had like pure intentions with like trying to save this thing. Right. And like not profit from it. And like, you know. So he was the um, one, he was the one that reached out to you and asked you to kind of uh, create this. Yeah, he kind um, of was like, you know, this is what I'm doing. So yeah, then I was like, all right. So we just started kind of like in the beginning, just like shooting like once every few months, you know, like mm -hmm. and then we'd have different, like I'd have like a different sound person. Or it was kind of just small at first and then in where the story really went. Because like, as you know, with Saving Banks, it took us like six years to shoot that. It's insane. Finish. It's insane. So like we had, we were actually filming over five years, basically, with Crazy. like one year of like editing. Crazy. So a lot of it was just kind of like not really knowing where it's going to end up and just having it be like something that like, mm -hmm. you know, I would work on every like now and again, you right. know, so I was right. committed right. to it. There was no money or anything like that. But it was like anytime there was like it was going to get moved somewhere, it was like something was going to happen with it. I would I would show up and I'd film it. Right. You know? So would you say that you uh, went with the flow rather than having like a pre-composed script from the very beginning? Yeah. Yeah. We definitely like just kind of like captured what, the way we could. Yeah. It's just a lot easier to like go with the like flow of the river than like to mm -hmm. fight. You know? It's like, and then, the, then you can get creative in how you present it, you know? Right. Um, right. You, just, you, you, you have to solve problems, but you can like be creative about that. And then mm -hmm. like, turn a negative into a positive somehow, you know? Right, right, so right. There's always a solution, you know? Like, right. worst case scenario, you could always do animation, you know? Like, it's like, <laughs> right. we did that one time in Saving Banksy and yes. like, yes. It's and, like, uh, and that worked whatever, very well. Whatever's necessary to make that point, mm -hmm. you know? And like, exactly. for that, for that animation and specifically, I would want to give a shout out to like, um, Jim Dershberger and mm -hmm. um, Jay Howell. They did Sanjay, Goof, San, San, Sanjay and Craig. Right. on Nickelodeon and like super talented dudes but they did that animation um for cut, us. cutting out the banksy image right and mm -hmm. yeah yes because that because we didn't have footage of any of that you know right. but we want right. to make that point you right. know so right. it's right. like but um and it worked really well it was very organically implemented and it was just like you know it's part of the film and it worked really well Uh, but somehow I was really impressed because I, I thought that you were able to really capture very important moments of, uh, you know, um, even those kind of um, key key moments of obviously removing the, the, the image, but also these negotiations with uh, Mr. Kirst Kessler, right, and, and, and that art establishment world, and even like having him on the phone with uh with the owner of the like, like was it was it planned or did it just happen like can you can oh, you dude, all right i'll tell you i'll tell you yeah but so like i kind of knew he was shady like mm -hmm. a little bit mm -hmm. because of, like the palestine stuff i already knew right. that he was supporting those mm -hmm. so like when i went to interview him i kind of went in and uh i went in real light which is like a camera and tripod Mm -hmm. And I could tell right away he was one of those types of people that enjoyed the like attention. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. I just kind of like, you know, like saw where I went and he like started like telling me his plans with like Basil and all that. Mm -hmm. And so then not knowing the guy with, you know, uh, mm -hmm. Brian mm -hmm. with the rat. 
hey, maybe we should, uh, you know, like I have this friend with a bank Z, you know, to put them in contact. Mm-hmm. And then that's what that phone call ended up being. And then I wow. just was like, I filmed it because it happened like, it was like, hey, here's his number. And like Kessler, as soon as he saw the photo of, of, of uh-huh. Brian's, he was like, what's his number? And yeah. just like, yeah. you know. Wow, insane. Phone insane but it just felt so organic and so like you know it's just perfect it, it sits in the perfect place and adds to the story immensely and really kind of shows the characters uh, really well uh did he know uh the, the caster did he know uh or how did he react to the final piece because he's portrayed as he is portrayed and though you don't have you don't have like a, any kind of subliminal messaging there but it's obvious that he is doing what he's doing and the art world i mean the street artists have different opinion on what is his contribution contribution right to the art world um do you know what was his reaction to the to the film uh you know i don't but um i i think that like it's a matter of perspective mm-hmm. because it's like, you know, he's, he's the one in the legal right mm. thing, you know, like it's the ironic thing. Right. So like out of everything that happens in the movie, he's the one that's most in like the like black and white legal, legal, right. Right. You know, because right. of like his paperwork right. and like how he goes about his business. Right. 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 So it's like morally and all of that other stuff is just like other stuff. Right. So, but like, also the other thing is like, uh there's a lot of people that see it and if they are like want a banksy like that now they mm-hmm. now from that movie whether however he's portrayed now they know where to find one right you know so right. it's like that's right. the other thing is i don't think it's actually been it hasn't had a negative impact on it, you know right. like right 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 no he's, i think he's i think he's you know probably doing fine right you know? right basically getting like an advertisement for his his business yeah with the film and also i always kind of got an air that he kind of enjoyed being like he was always viewed kind of as like a, a little bit of a, a like a villain in within the art yeah. world yeah so like i kind of think that he kind of like enjoys a little bit of that like all right you know? all right, like he's all right. Been a, he likes he, he looks like he enjoys the role right you know right. like right. you could tell when he was giving us the tour mm-hmm. of all of his like banksies and the way he talked about them like you could just see it <laughs> but, you know he's like right right, he's right. Like reveling in it exactly And you know the 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 one re- thing that really kind of um, impressed me with this film is that you are raising really uh, important question is what's the value of art actually right what what is the what is the place of art and and how are we supposed to treat it and uh, you know what's the whole point and it's really amazing to see how artists street artists are willingly doing their the thing that they're doing even they know that it might be you know destroyed in 48 hours or it, it it can be gone or you know it's it's really interesting to think to to kind of get into that mind space of the artist like how do they why do they do that how do you think as a filmmaker who spends some time with artists i think it all goes down to like something that happens in their life you know that like is they they view as like kind of like uh you know, that they need to react to mm-hmm. in, in a way. And that reaction just, you know, comes out like in, you know, it could come out in like, you know, visuals, it could come out in music, it could come out mm-hmm. in dance, it could come out mm-hmm. in all these, you know, all these different, you know, outlets, but right. because of whatever kind of like, you know, perfect storm of their situation and everything, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it turns into what it is, but it's all a reaction to something, you know? Right, right. Um, otherwise, I mean, they might still just be a creative person, but I think that it adds like a lightning bolt of energy to whatever they, whatever's being done right. and make, right. gives it more of a purpose, right. which in turn makes it more interesting and like, you know, mm-hmm. uh, more poetic or aesthetically right. pleasing, if you will. Right, right. And there is, I guess there is also like a sense of mission uh for many of these artists and uh when you kind of try to compare the two worlds right the street art with its messages and with its expression and then the kind of establishment uh contemporary art space with these auctions and uh you know these people who who are buying uh this crazily expensive works of art uh, there is like a different mindset and different 
kind of it feels like those people are living in two different worlds <laughs> basically and it's 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 really beautifully shown in your film and uh, it's also like a very good food for thought like what are we doing here actually what's the, what's the purpose of all of this and uh, i was just curious uh what was your largest insight or maybe biggest discovery uh, for yourself as a director working on this film something that surprised you about or you learned something from that yeah i'd say during the shooting of basil the mm -hmm. art basil stuff there's a shot of like uh the sol israeli soldier being searched by the little mm -hmm. girl yes you know like with like the like police officer like standing next to it it's like roped off right it, but it's like ripped out of like in like uh gaza like yes. that yes. that moment like filming that was mm -hmm. like the most surreal kind of like moment mm -hmm. in the whole project for me. right right like right. there was like a weird like like uh like a like trance like state in my like, mm -hmm. like when i was capturing that stuff right there's like right. bullet holes in the in the painting right right but like you know, so it was put up illegally without any permission. Mm -hmm. And now it's been like moved and is like an artifact with a police officer guarding it because at the time there were rumors of somebody coming in and splashing paint off. Right, right. And like destroying it. There, there was like right. actually real fears of like them being destroyed. Right. So they had to put like police officers yeah, like yeah. 24 hours a day on. Some security measures. Yeah. You know, kind of that moment where I was like, I kind of like sense the importance mm -hmm. of, of the story. Mm -hmm. And like what was being, what was happening to where mm -hmm. it was like, no, this isn't just like a comedy, comedic art world, yeah. you know, like journey. Like this right. is like got some real layers of like greed and like, mm -hmm. you know, power and like kind of right. stuff that needs to be discussed. Right. right. And right. also kind of the shadiness of the art world in a sense. Right. You know, right. because it's like, I don't think people realize how much commerce moves mm. like through this like kind of like opaque, uh, you know, hemisphere if you will right you know like if you want to move by you know 50 million dollars from like russia to the united states what better way to do that than a canvas in a tube right you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's like a perfect perfect yeah. system so no, it's, it's designed like that it's designed mm -hmm. like hundreds of years mm -hmm. it's been like, that's what it is it's like it operates as this like mm -hmm. You know, and so like I've always been on the graffiti and the street art is like definitely the fringe of the yeah. art movement. Like, yes. It's, yes. Like, yes. it's in the art movement, but it's like, it's not like, you know, like even Banksy isn't like, you know, in the club as far mm -hmm. as, mm -hmm. you know, Red mm -hmm. is kind of getting in the club, but like, there are, it's, it's a different, like, just different worlds. Right, you know? right, right. But it's also interesting to see uh, the separation, for example, inside the street art world. So obviously, originally, everybody, everyone started kind of from that graffiti um, chapter and uh, just, like, you know, going out there and just leaving some tags or leaving, you know, just some images. And then over time, you see certain artists uh, kind of stepping aside from that tradition and going beyond and uh, start communicating certain messages and uh, making uh, stance and uh, like, you know, kind of creating the narrative that is uh, quite different from the uh, traditional um, graffiti style. So it's already become socially becomes political and something that maybe helped uh, Banksy to stand out in a way is uh, his messages, right? Because all of his works, they are very contextual. And uh, it's, as you said, the, the, the image that was ripped off from a wall, it was there for a purpose. It was there in a specific place, time and, and space because it served the purpose. And um, how do you think, um, how, how important is it to, to have those messages or, or being able to communicate certain messages uh, to the world through the medium of art, because you obviously have this huge, enormous potential of influencing other people. So do you think that maybe that particular part of, let's say, let's talk about Banksy, since the film is about him. Do you think that that really helped him to stand out and become the Banksy that we know him today? Yeah, I think, I think what stands out with him is like threefold. It's that he has like 
a really good sense of humor, right. which is international, you know, like, so the humor can like trans, you know, it can cut across, you know, continents right. and still like land, mm -hmm. but he's also a great, like, like a great, like marketing mind. So right. like, he's like able to kind of have like a cause and like know which wall to hit and like do his right. homework right. and like, you know, hit on all of those cylinders to where the message is like powerful as well. Right, right. You know, and then um, his like, yeah, his choice of places and the story, the grander fitting in into the story of what all like he's like, you know, messaging about. Um, that really set him apart, you mm -hmm. know, from like a lot of, you know, it, it, it hit pedestrians or like civilians more than just graffiti people. Because a lot of graffiti is aimed like tags and stuff. Yeah. Like most of the population that doesn't isn't into graffiti just sees that stuff as like noise. Yeah. You know, yeah, like yeah. graffiti artists and taggers mm -hmm. like really read all that stuff. You know, <laughs> it's, and it's like, the language, it's the language of the street. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So like, you know. So apart from being like a social activist, Banksy is a genius of marketing and PR, basically. Yeah, but I like but the thing I respect is all these years, like he you know, makes his income selling like prints and stuff through like, you know, his, his, uh, you know, connections and stuff, but then like keeps his activism, like pure in form, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which leaves it untainted in a sense, you know, right. like right. He has, by doing his guerrilla stuff, yes. he's not beholden to any organization, mm -hmm. you know, of any kind NGO or like, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. nonprofit, mm -hmm. he can right. partner with them. But usually he'll just partner with them involuntarily. You right. know, he'll just leave right. a piece right. like on their building or something. And then, and then it's up to the boys' club to like, you know, yeah. auction off for right. benefit right. of their finances. Right, right. You know, so like mm. there is there's like there is like an authentic Robin Hood aspect of what he does that like I have a tremendous respect for. Right. Because right. that's the pure intention. That's the pure shit. Where like right. he he could, you mm -hmm. know, he could have gone the more like commercial route and like mm -hmm. revealed itself you yeah. know legally yeah. at this point because enough but like lawyers mm -hmm. that would help him you know like yeah. fight yeah. off a lot of the legal challenges and stuff i think right right and it could benefit greatly financially right but like the fact that he doesn't like you know mm -hmm. leads me to believe mm -hmm. there's a reason for that right and right. i think that reason is like you know for the right reasons right yeah i think it's pure in nature he has a so, purpose yeah. as an artist no, all my favorite artists have purpose. You know? Right, so, right, but, right, right. But he, 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 he decided to take his own route, and uh, he's really unique in what he's doing. How, how was the film uh, per, like recepted, perceived after it was out in the art world, Saving Banksy? Uh, it was received great in the art world, like excellent. Like artists seem to um, like it's become kind of a calling card uh, mm -hmm. in a sense, as far as like the art world artists go. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit different for like museums and like art fairs and stuff. Like they mm -hmm. view it like differently. Right. So it's very much like people of the art world love it. Mm -hmm. Less so on like the high end or like the powerful art auction side of it. Like I typically keep a low profile if I go to like art auctions or anything like that. Right. Right. I think there might be suspect. Um, from the people that I wanted to get, that we got good reviews from the people that I that was most important to me to get good mm -hmm, reviews from. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, we got mm -hmm. Well, this is a really beautiful film. I strongly encourage everybody who is uh, watching to or listening to this interview to uh, go uh, to the internet and, and watch Saving Banksy film. Um, from the psychological perspective, because a director, and obviously a documentary director, a person who works with, uh, with other people, is a psychologist in a way. That's at least what I believe in. Um, how do you approach uh, creation of the psychological portrait of um, your uh, subjects in, in your films? When you have, let's say, an artist and uh, you have to tell their story, so where do you start as a filmmaker? First thing I try and start with is... Uh like having an honest look at the subject and like, uh, you know, try and figure out what the most, like what the story is mm -hmm. and then what the most interesting aspects of the story is. Try and streamline all of that so that like you're telling their story authentically, but you're really dialing into like the most interesting kind of like angles of it that'll mm -hmm. act as like hooks for the audience, mm -hmm. you know, so that like you keep their attention 
you mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. Uh, through the whole process. It's like, and it's getting shorter and shorter. When we made Saving Banks, I think it was like two minutes. Every two minutes, like you need to have, kind of have a hook. Yeah. You know, yes. to like yes. keep people like, uh, to keep that flow kind of state. Right, right. But now it's like, I think 30 seconds, you wow. know, it's like- what Attention like, spam is really short these days, right? But you'll notice our protest is actually like a much more like- Exactly. Like, like, like the energy of that movie yeah. is much more like, like we wanted it to, you know, this is the bad pun, but we wanted it to start a protest to feel like you just did like a rail of like cocaine. Yeah. You know, and you just <laughs> came out of it. You're like- <laughs> Just going all in. Yeah, we wanted to like, you know, mainline the mm-hmm. activism and like have them go out and like, you know, be right. ready for the for the election, you know. Right, right. Oh, um, right. different intentions. Right, right. How to become an insider, how to uh, win the trust of, uh, of the creatives in that world and uh, really be able to, you know, being present at these key moments and being able to capture it basically. I think the only thing you can do is really just be authentic mm-hmm. with them, like not try and like have ulterior motives, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. that's the worst thing you can possibly do going mm-hmm. into any of that mm-hmm. is like have ulterior motives. Your right. intentions have to be good. Yes. They should be aligned. If they're aligned with the artists, then like things will, mm-hmm. you know, can, can move real fast and like, you know, efficiently. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's in the benefit of like both parties mm-hmm. in that sense, but you also have to be down to do whatever it takes, Yeah. you know, for, and sometimes that means like gray areas, you know, mm-hmm. uh, like deciding, you know, like trespassing and like having mm-hmm. like, your kind of like plan, you mm-hmm. know, of like mm-hmm. how you deal with it. If you get like busted, right. you know, right. like right. you gotta be a documentarian. You gotta not lose your footage. Right. to the police and actually right. endanger the people you're documenting right you know right. so you've got to walk a fine line right right you know right. to to get a lot of that kind of material right. and i think what the unfortunate thing is like there were a lot of people that like were doing this kind of like filming around the world like 10 years ago mm-hmm. and you know didn't have the right intentions or were trying to ride something and like mm-hmm. ended up getting caught and then like the footage like getting caught and like you know, they all has like a domino effect. Yeah, yeah, right. And so, you know, but I've heard some like horror stories, you know, mm-hmm. of people that like that kind of stuff has happened to. Right. Very um, risky, risky business. Yeah, and like you got to say, treat it serious, man. Like, I've, mm-hmm. always, I've always like had the utmost respect for even like tagging, you know, mm-hmm. like I think tagging is one of the most pure forms of uh, graffiti, you know, mm-hmm. like there's no faking it. You know, there's no faking it. You can't, you know, it's, you're not pasting anything up that you made in a studio somewhere. Yeah. You know, you have the least amount of materials mm-hmm. to work with. Right. And you're like, so somebody that's able to do something dope with that has like mm-hmm. the highest level of like talent in my mind, you know? Right, right, right. Um, it's all relative, I guess. Yeah. Right, right. Spending that amount of time that you spend with all these uh, artists and uh, creating almost 100 films, um, how do you think what helps um, certain artists to stand out and uh, to really kind of reach the next level? Uh, maybe personally, uh, some traits of character or some certain features about them that really help them to stand out? Or how would you describe uh, maybe top three personality qualities of you know, high-performing artists in, in the industry? I would say the... Um... There's one like common trait that I've seen mm-hmm. amongst like the most uh, successful uh, artists, and that is almost this just like you know uh, drive. It's just like this like crazy like drive to just like constantly like like they don't question their like creative process. Right. Their whole reality is designed around their creative process. Right. And so they just like are like you know, dialed in and just, mm-hmm. it's like more than a full-time job. It's like, right, you know, right. it's like almost two full-time jobs, it seems right, like. Right, right, right. You know, but then they're also managing a life somewat, but their mm-hmm. life is also entrenched within right. the artwork. Right. You know, right. like, so whatever, like family, mm-hmm. how many kids, mm-hmm. right. they're in the mix of like the whole, <laughs> like, just like ocean of creativity. Right, right, right. And it's like, mm-hmm. like witnessing that kind of, uh, you know, um, thing happening. 
is like fascinating, you know, yeah. because it's like you're just kind of watching like magic mm. in a sense, you know, and like like Alex Gray uh, and the Chapel of Sacred Mirrors in New York City or upstate New York is mm -hmm. one of those places right. that like it's just mm -hmm. the energy and like the creativity and the things that happen there, like with like painting and like just people that like are like drawn to this place. Right. It's just like it's a power. It's like a power center. Right. Right. You know, and they're building like a, a museum right now. They're mm -hmm. called Empion. It's like, you know, going to be this like museum of uh, visionary artwork. And it's magic or right. alchemy. It's right. Alchemy. Right. But it is, right. You know, it's the right ingredients all kind of like falling into place. Right. And then just like matching marvelous together. Things happening, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so passion, basically, right? A really yeah. strong passion. Um, how, how do you think what would be uh, passion other... and talent they need the talent also but passion mm -hmm. is the main thing because there's plenty of mm -hmm. talent talented people yes they have like fallen into a lull for you know right reasons that might not be like you know their fault or whatever but it's like right. it's hard to get out of that stuff sometimes so it's like how, how do you think what are maybe one or two extra features or 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 personality qualities that you can layer on the top of passion and you know to um, really kind of reach your destination as an artist? I think uh, fearlessness, mm -hmm. like having like a fearlessness, like like one of my, my heroes has always been Hunter S. Thompson and uh, Ralph Steadman, you know, that duo right. has always been like a creative, like, you know, powerhouse, you know, mm -hmm. and anything that they like, you know, reported on or did. Right kind of like for me like gonzo has always just meant just going in you know mm -hmm. uh mm -hmm. like all in basically mm -hmm. you know not not like in, not being afraid of what the consequences are no matter how bad mm -hmm. you know it's like saying like you you plan for the work you you expect the worst mm -hmm. you prepare for the worst right prepare for the worst <laughs> yeah yeah you just kind of like deal with it and then deal with the consequences mm -hmm. and, and have like faith that like if the intentions and like everything is supposed to land the right it's supposed to land right then you come out the other side and you're like and you're all good kind of um, a leap of faith but you know mm -hmm. it, it, it seems to work out uh speaking about filmmaking right uh from your perspective as a film director how do you think what is the anatomy of the film or um let's say you get a new idea how do you go about it? What, where, where do you start, basically? I start putting visuals together, like like things that like you know, if it's sort of an idea is like atomizing, mm -hmm. like just visual cues that I start like you know putting up, like in, in a place and like seeing what like something starts like forming as, and then uh, I try and think of like the like if it's like an important subject matter, mm -hmm. it seems the stuff, the stuff that I end up making. There's a lot of stuff that doesn't end up getting made and it mm -hmm. always comes mm -hmm. down to what the important thing that's happening in the, you know right. like there'll be something that happens and then i'll feel like i need to like frontline something mm -hmm. you know and and make it happen which is what happened with art of protest last year you know right. like right. Right. really kind of like was pushed to like right get done i've got a constant like stable of things that i've just been like developing mm -hmm. you know like and it, 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 I might not be like, able to do one of them consistently. Mm -hmm. So I switch gears a lot, you know, like it's like, right. and I don't really try and control that. I just mm -hmm. like make it easy for me to like, like work with it. Kind right. of like I've right. seen the artists in these other situations do. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to emulate that within my own environment. Right, right. You know, and right. like um, harness that same kind of like, you know, energy. M mindset. So basically you would have certain ideas uh, but you wouldn't create like a narrative from the very beginning. You would rather let the characters and the story unfold kind of in front of you and then capture it. And then in the in the post-production, in editing, you would try to bring this together. For documentary stuff, yes. For mm -hmm. narrative stuff, I've got a couple of narrative projects that I'm currently working on. Mm -hmm. And those, obviously, you have an endpoint that like you're working for. Those are more locked in. Mm -hmm much more locked in obviously but like with documentaries i think it's it, you just gotta kind of like let it unfold you know right um but there is some luck to it too you know there's mm -hmm. definitely like layer of luck 
it's like, what are the odds that everything would end up going right? You know, it's like, <laughs> there are so many variables on the way, kind of. Yeah. So, and mm -hmm. it kind of it kind of worked out that way. So, how do you think? What is the most difficult part about about documentary filmmaking? Really, just funding. You know, like mm -hmm. finding like mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. proper funding, and like funding that doesn't have ulterior motives. Right. You know, so you're right. not like you know because like it would be really easy to go and work for some shady company. Mm -hmm. You know, making propaganda. You right, know, during right. political cycles, especially. Right. right you right, know. Right. But it's like, I feel like that clouds your uh, messaging. You right. know, it, 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 it like kind of discredits you in a sense. Mm -hmm. You know, or it does for me. You know. Right. Right. I don't know how it's viewed outside of that, but you know, it's keeping your morals intact. Mm -hmm. You know, while also you like your 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 projects moving forward. Biggest challenge, I would say, if you're in Hollywood. It was different elsewhere. Let's say one of the purposes also of this podcast is also to provide some insights, you know, for youngsters and maybe those who are thinking to get started in, in the industry. Uh, let's imagine a situation where you have a student who is willing to create a, their first documentary film. Uh, what would you recommend that person to start from um, in order to, you know, come up with um, some more or less uh, tangible outcome in terms of the you know quality and and being able to make sure that the story is told properly i'd say the first thing they should do is like kind of look around their surroundings in their environment or whatever city they're in and like just kind of like put feelers out and see if anything is happening that is just really interesting to them mm -hmm. like they just like or they personally find super interesting and then it's like once they're that interested then the way that they go about capturing it will um be that much better because they're motivated to be that much better because like they'll have that like drive to you know present it properly right um but you really have to like you can't force that you can't like do a documentary on something that you're not like super interested in because mm -hmm. you're going to spend hundreds of hours you know like working on it Mm -hmm. like thousands of hours possibly you know so like you want to make sure that you like love what you're like you know document right um which is one of the reasons why art is always infused mm -hmm. in what i'm doing because i love art right so that makes it personally more palatable for me right but then also i think it makes it more visually interesting for the audience too right you know right, right. um so it's like a two-fold kind of mm. And how would you recommend somebody to go about uh, tackling the most difficult part about filmmaking from your words is the funding. Um, what would you recommend for somebody? Where can they start looking into, you know, looking for those opportunities? Doing a little bit of homework, mm. finding out who is out there, like activist uh, groups, um, nonprofits, you know, there's like grants, grant writers, there's, um, you know, there's a lot of like uh, celebrities, like athletes mm -hmm. that are willing to like lend their name to causes. A lot of them have nonprofits of their own. And like, you know, like LeBron has like a production company that's doing amazing stuff. Right. All of those kinds of places are like places where like a lot, if you're, if what you're doing aligns with what like other organizations are doing, mm -hmm. then it's good to like try and find partners. Right. you know, that you can like uh, team up with. And, mm -hmm. you know, if not just get proper funding, you might be like pulled in with them on something, you know, so it's right. like. How do you think, how important it is for filmmakers to be featured on uh, certain platforms, let's say Netflix, how, how important it is for, for aspiring filmmakers to be uh, part of that system or to, to, put, to get their films featured? I don't know, that was difficult. I haven't really thought about that too much. Mm. Um, was it something that happened naturally let's say with the uh, saving banks you didn't intend at first but it was just kind yeah, of logical those were producers the, the producers of saving banks were mm -hmm. the ones with the connections that made that happen mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um which i was stoked about like right, i mean I, right. I was i was grateful that we mm -hmm. also they also managed to get us like 40 theatrical screenings around the world right, uh, right. so right. like they did a great job of uh you know, producers, uh, mm -hmm. Kevin, mm -hmm. 
Eva, Brian, like they all they all did a great job in like getting distribution and stuff like that, like square right. away. How do you think did that help you to kind of get more visibility in the art space? And I mean, for yourself as a director, as a filmmaker, uh, was it helpful? I think it helped establish like what my like uh, moral moral code is mm -hmm. and my style, visual style. So in that sense, I think it, it, probably, it probably helped me establish that, you know? Also just being like something that like had like was on Netflix and had such a far reach. Right. You know, like it was like most people that I, I meet have like heard of it or mm -hmm. like seen it, you know? So it's been, it's acted as like a calling card and since right. it had good reviews and was like, you know, well-received that yes. is, so it's been like positive in that sense. Right. How do you think for yourself as a filmmaker, what is the most important thing to, you know, in your craft? uh yourself personally w what what is the message that you are trying to share or what would you like to people to um understand through your films it's kind of different for every mm -hmm. for every every one of them you know like saving banksy for me ended up being a lot about greed you know that like that struggle you know And like Brian, his credit hasn't sold that like rat still. He's still waiting for the right place for it. You know, obviously last year was a bad year for museums. Yeah. So I don't know what's been happening. I know it's been like probably in storage. Right. But like he hasn't sold it, you know. It'll be interesting to see where that story even ends, you know, because it still hasn't ended like even right. like, you know, four years, five years later. Right. You know, Art of Protest was a completely different thing though, where like mm -hmm. we saw a real sense of urgency, like, There was a lot of concern before the election with like, you know, President Trump and mm -hmm. there being like a big crackdown if he got reelected right. on like activist groups, mm -hmm. you know, like the way things were shaping up, like with police and stuff and like the struggles that were happening were starting to look like more and more like authoritarian. That was really concerning mm -hmm. for, for mm -hmm. you know, for a lot of us. Right. right. And so there was much more of a sense of urgency of like, we need to act now because we might not be able to fucking act again like this. Like mm -hmm. if we, if this guy wins, like mm -hmm. we might not ever be able to act on this again, you know? And so that's why so many artists were willing to jump in and like mm -hmm. provide interviews for that thing. Right. And we had like right. 40 something interviews, you know? Yeah, that, that's um, insane. Like in a 45 minute, like, you know, that, that thing was like packed, you yeah. know? Yeah. Um, But it was like that was that was a challenge, man. Shout out to uh, our editor, mm -hmm. Josh. Like, like, crush it. Incredible, incredible work. Yeah. Uh, what are the some of the projects that you are working maybe at this point and uh, maybe projecting for the future? Uh, are there some areas where you would like to go deeper into or discover, or maybe something that is like on the back of your mind that you wanted to do for a long time and hoping to to get accomplished? Uh, one project, it's actually, it's an animated project, dark comedy, but like, it's going to be playing off of historic, like events. Mm -hmm. And it all stems from, I, I was like doing some research on like, I have, I have a dachshund, which are really funny dogs, you know, if you've been yeah. around dogs. And so like, mm -hmm. I was doing some research online and I found out that there was a, a emperor of Germany, Kaiser Wilhelm had two dachshunds. Yes. who were notoriously bad behaving dogs and like killed Franz Ferdinand's hens and like wow. killed like a diplomat's rabbit and stuff. So like these untrained maniac dachshunds wow. owned by like crazy, like, you know, character. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so I'm like, that's a great idea for a show. And so like <laughs> mm -hmm. now it's all the events that basically led up to World War One. Wow. But like told from the perspective of the pet of like the pets of all the royal family. <laughs> so it's like, This is amazing. <laughs> this is amazing. Is it going to be a, a film or a, a it's an anime. I'm, 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 I'm trying to sell it as like a series, you know, series. so it's right. like, yeah, yeah, right. so it's like a series, but like things are moving along, you know, uh, like I love documentaries, mm -hmm. but that's like not all that I've, uh, I didn't start doing documentaries because there was no like, you know, I, I, you know, graduated during that like bus. And yes. so all the jobs kind of like, yeah, there wasn't a lot of commercial work I could get. Right, right. You know? So right. it's like, I took documentaries because they were cheap. Right, you know? right. Like a necessity, basically. Yeah. 
So th this project you are working currently, is it like you are on the conceptual level at this point or you have already started some production or you're pitching now to, to studios? We're uh, about to start pitching and like, mm -hmm. it's, I've been developing it though for like, like a couple of years now. So that's that's a really kind of important uh, stage, obviously, to to get uh, partners, right? And one board with, with the project. Exactly, exactly. In, in the show, we have the part where I give the chance to the guest to ask a question of the show or a question of the, the day um, from creatives in Europe, filmmakers, uh, anything you would like to, to know about European filmmakers. What is it like doing like music industry stuff in like uh, Northern, Northern Europe? Like, what is it like working with bands and like, you know, music videos and all that kind of like, kind of stuff? What's that structure like? Yeah, so we can ask people uh, who are uh, involved and they can uh, leave their comments in, in the video. On my behalf, uh, I've done small uh, documentaries myself and it's also very interesting. I think there are like quite, quite many connections because the art world is, it has its unique language, I think. And the creatives around the world, regardless of where they are, I think there are reasons uh, for them to do what they do. And there are certain motives that drive them to create their art. And I think it's a very universal language. Colin, I'm, I'm uh, hugely grateful to you for, for doing this interviewing for your time. Thank you very much for uh, coming up and sharing your stories. First of all, how people can uh, find you and how they can follow you on your journey and uh, you know support with uh, your future projects. Yeah, I'm on uh, Instagram. It's uh, at Seats on Titanic. I haven't been as active uh, recently just because mm -hmm. I've been like, you know, bouncing back from some health stuff. So I'll be right. more active in like in the future again. You know, I'm on Twitter. CMD-Films is my website. Yes. You know, see what projects are coming up and stuff. So I will link up everything in the description and so people can go follow and, and support you on your, on your journey. Great. Thank um, you. Colin, it was a pleasure uh, wishing you best of luck with your upcoming projects and um, looking forward to, to see the series and, 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 you know, laugh, laugh, laugh about it and, and like really enjoy your future work. Thank you, man. That was a great honor. That's it for today. Make sure to follow Colin Day on his social media channel and follow up with him on his future art projects. If you got any value from this episode, make sure to smash that like button and subscribe to the channel. I'm Oles for the ALM Studios. Till next time, stay strong and remember to keep it rock and roll.